Taylor Decker's on my All-22 fantasy team. Stop. They don't care. So the strategic component to this game is through the roof. Your predictions, right, your forecasting in fantasy football into how good is this player? This is going to, it's going to change the industry. Yeah. yeah. I moved to the old town where it goes down. Look at me now. I wrote my goals down. I hold it down. Made myself proud. What is up, everybody? Welcome into the All 22 podcast. We are live for signups. If you haven't yet, go to all 22.com to sign up using promo code second season. That's 2ND season for $20 off of your All 22 membership for 2023. Get in there and start drafting. We only have a few weeks left. Uh, Ray. I'll admit it. I didn't get to watch Hard Knocks episode two. Did you watch it? I did. I did. It was a lot of fun. Uh, our boy Quinn and uh, Quinn and Williams got a lot of airtime, and uh, yeah, he's a fun character, as you know. You know. Is there so, anything uh, that's like going to go viral, like bless you, thank you, or anything like that, or calamari? I, I don't think. Wait, what was the calamari one? Calamari. Calamari. He basically. Oh, Kyler said, Murray. Like, yeah. <laughs> calamari. <laughs> calamari. Uh, I don't think there's anything like like oh this particular thing is just viral. It's just more like a like a consistent, just like positive, just like I love this guy, you know, uh, one of those. He he got some good airtime and and he deserves it. He deserves it. He's a fun dude. All right. Yeah. Any anything else noteworthy? No, nah, I mean it's hard knocks. It's you know you lay on the couch. You're, it just gets you ready for football season. And um, between that, so got to catch up on that. And you have to also. We haven't seen it yet, but uh, was it Swamp Kings or something? The the Florida Gators Netflix series, I think, released uh, the twenty second right today. So that's another one we have to watch for the season starts. Just, wow! Uh, yeah. All right. Tim Tebow. I'm so and behind. The, yeah, Tim Tebow in that era of the Florida Gators. That's yeah, that's must view TV. Before, I mean, college football kicks off this Saturday, like week zero. They have like eight games. So yes, I got to get this all in in the next like seventy two hours. Like Caleb Williams happen. plays right, like this weekend. Yeah, but he plays on, on like uh, like the Pac-12 network, which is in like eighteen households in the United States, and, and no one's going to see it. Uh, I think it, I think the thing is like UMass is also playing at that time, and they're on national TV, but like USC San Jose State is not. So makes sense. Yeah, that's that's pretty much why the Pac-12 doesn't exist in twelve months, and. Yeah, but Swamp Kings, get to it. Cool, yeah. And I, I mean, we're already behind. Like I missed an episode of Hard Knocks already. I haven't seen any Swap Kings yet. Swap Kings yet. So uh, yeah, I'm already behind. Two big uh, things of news from this week. So first, Baker Mayfield is announced as the starting quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Ray, you and I were kind of talking about last last episode how – you know, Baker just looks like a pro's pro when he's out there in the preseason, something that, you know, you don't get to see from a lot of the young quarterbacks that are out there competing. But when you see a guy with years of NFL experience, number one pick, he basically goes out there in the preseason and makes it look kind of easy, right? So this wasn't really a shock to us. Yeah, no, not that Baker Mayfield can't be overtaken by, you know, certain NFL quarterbacks, but Kyle Trask is not one of them, so... It's, it's his job for the next year, a couple of years maybe, and we'll see where it goes from there. But we've always said he's better than he's been given credit for, and he deserves some more respect around the league. So, you know, he's still got some weapons there, and he's got a decent offensive line, we think, right? Maybe not as great as it was two years ago, but I think he's got enough to make something happen. Yeah, Tampa's in a kind of a weird situation because they're like semi-rebuilding, semi-keeping the gang together, right? It's like they haven't really committed one way or the other. And then they throw Baker in there, but it's like a pretty good offense, right? Like it has a top 15 receiving core in the NFL. It's got a decent offensive line, like maybe top 20 offensive line in the NFL. Like it's not a bad team. And again, Baker's not a terrible quarterback. So I wouldn't be shocked if Tampa goes out there and ends up like a seven or eight one team. Yeah. And it's not like Tom Brady was on fire last year either. I mean, he wasn't peak Tom Brady. He was still Tom Brady, but he was not peak Tom Brady. So in that division, it's not it's not uh, a stretch for them to really be in it at the end of the year. Right. And then the other uh, piece of news from this week is just the Jonathan Taylor trade. So the uh, Indianapolis Colts have given Jonathan Taylor the right to go and seek a trade. Uh, it's essentially meaningless until something happens, right? It's only saying that it's not uh, – 
like another team talking to Jonathan Taylor wouldn't be breaking the rules at this point. They wouldn't be penalized for doing so, just giving him that ability to have that direct contact with other teams. But the other teams have to be willing to give the Colts the compensation that they need. And reports right now are that they're asking for a first round pick um, or the uh, kind of like equal trade that like the 49ers gave for Christian McCaffrey, which in my opinion, I think is a little strong, uh, especially because you have to pay him immediately once he gets there. So what do you think of the situation, Ray? Yeah, it's 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 funny because it's this is why running backs are mad. It's like, I'm not going to pay you any money, but I'm going to ask for a return as if you were a top player at a premium position. It's like it, it, it's one or the other. Either he's worth being paid as much as a player who would garner a first round pick plus on the open market tomorrow, or he's not, which is it? If he is, then pay him. If he's not, then don't ask for that in return for a trade. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty frustrating if you're Jonathan Taylor, I'm honestly not sure how it's all going to play out. These things always seem to get resolved at the, you know, the deadline, whatever the, the, you know, the deadline would be in this case, whether that's week one or week four, who knows? Um, but yeah, I'd be super frustrated if I'm Jonathan Taylor, like, you know, something's got to give you, you can't have it both ways. And you just kind of go through the list individually of NFL teams. And it's like, most teams will say, no, I'm not going to give up a first round pick. And I'm certainly not going to give up a first round pick and then sign him to a large contract. It just, not many teams are going to do that. So unless you have some type of package that doesn't involve a first round pick, you know, multiple seconds or a second or third or what have you, multiple day two picks, most teams aren't going to give that up for a running back either, not with tread on the tires already. So, I, I don't see how it's going to get resolved other than these things just usually get resolved. And we're just going to have to wait and see when we wake up one day and, you know, open up Twitter or X and, you know, he's reporting to somewhere back to Indy or to whoever at the last minute said, okay, we're dealing for Jonathan Taylor. But um, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone would, would have a clear sort of visual as to how this thing is going to play up. It's just guessing at this point. Yeah, I hate the uh, the one rumor that's going around. It's that the Dolphins are going to trade for him. And it's something they would do, right? It's the one team that's kind of taking the Rams approach of let's just trade assets for star players and hope that it works out, right? They traded for Jalen Ramsey. They traded for Tyreek Hill. They signed Taron Armstead. Like they're going after big name players. Jonathan Taylor definitely fits that mold. But it doesn't help their biggest need, which is the offensive line, right? It's like that offensive line is so bad still because Taron Armstead only plays half of a season. Um, and when he's not on the field, it looks really bad, right? The situation gets bad for Tua and the injuries and all that stuff adds up. And then they're going to go trade for Jonathan Taylor. And it's like, that just, it just doesn't help, right? Like that isn't the thing that's going to make them a great team. Sure. They're going to rush for a hundred yards game, but like, it's just not going to help them win games. They already lost a first round pick for tampering. So now you're going to give up another first round pick for a running back. I mean, what, what, are, you, what are you doing here at this point? What, what are we doing? And I mean, you drafted H. I know he's got like a shoulder thing, and we'll see. And he's going to get acclimated to the offense. He's not the starter right now, yada yada. But H. A. a fit. You're talking about speed. That offense is built around speed and space, and that's exactly what H. A. is. And you've had success with these other running backs uh, as well. So even then, I, I get that that's like the easy thing that people point to because they don't have a name bell cow running back. But stylistically, they don't really need him. They have guys that fit their offense stylistically already. It wouldn't be worth it if I'm the Dolphins to to make a deal for that. It it just wouldn't. I agree. I agree. And I'm upset that they're even thinking about it. And you you forgot that they traded a first last year for Bradley Chubb. So they lose one and then they add Bradley Chubb. Bradley Chubb is a good player. He's a good football player. But is he like, would you really trade a first round pick for a guy that like you you have to pay? I wouldn't, especially like Bradley Chubb, who's Kind of an middle of the pack edge rusher. Oh, that's that's a little spicy. He's Do you think he's like that much better than that? Would you put him in your top ten edge rushers in the NFL? No, but there's more than you know ten players who are not middle of the pack at edge. I mean, there's there's, there's a lot of edge rushers in the NFL. It's not just like here are ten great ones and then the rest are just you know who cares? Right. Like it's, it's middle of the pack to me is like that. is like fifteen to thirty five. It's like middle of the pack at edge, right? There's sixty four starting edge rushers. To me, that's middle of the pack. He's middle of the pack. He might be fifteen. He might be the, the top of that pack. If he's fifteen, that's middle of the pack in a twelve team all twenty two league. Is what you're saying? 
exactly. Boom. But that's still very Thanks valuable in all 22. <laughs> Thanks for making my point. <laughs> it's still very valuable is all I'm saying. And this is actually a great transition because when you looked at preseason storylines from week two, the biggest thing is that the edge rushers from the draft are making a huge impact, right? So we're talking about teams trading away play, uh, picks for edge rushers like Brad, uh, Bradley Chubb. They could have stayed and drafted maybe a guy like Will McDonald, Nolan Smith, or breakout Nick Herbig. So like those guys, and in addition to Will Anderson, really showed out this week and are proving why most of those guys were high draft picks. But the guy I wanted to really uh, talk about is Nick Herbig, who is one of your guys from the offseason. Do you want to talk about him and his performance a little bit? Yeah, love Nick Herbig. We spoke about him during the L22 Daily Series leading up to the draft as just a guy who just wins in both facets in, in pass rushing and in the run game. He had a sack, a hurry, two stops, and a forced fumble in week two after a solid week one showing too in the preseason. So he just feels like that edge player that like the Steelers draft in the middle of the draft. That's just a good starter, if not better for like eight to 10 years. And everybody just looks around asking themselves, how did we let the Steelers draft this guy again? And, um, you know, he doesn't have the prototype frame as far as like, Oh, he's six, five and has like super long arms or anything like that. But he just does everything so well down after down. And he just like, just keeps coming at you. Just when you watch his tape, every snap just feels like he's just getting a little bit more over on his opponent snap after snap after snap, like slowly just sort of going downhill and building momentum uh, play after play as the game just evolves. So, I mean, the Steelers do have, you know, High Smith and TJ Watt at edge. So we'll have to see how he ultimately fits in and carves a role for himself as far as getting enough snaps to be sort of viable in all 22. But if he keeps performing this way, he will find himself on the field because NFL coaches just don't leave guys like this who show out this well on the bench. He's playing well enough to have a big role on that defense. And, you know, again, we liked him heading into the draft as a whole before we knew where he'd end up just because of his style of play. And that's just completely translated over to the preseason so far. Obviously, the next step is to do it when the games really count and in the regular season when he's playing against starters, snap after snap after snap. Uh, but you can't ask for more, at least to this point, for a what a rookie fourth round pick who's probably going in the back end of the sixth and seventh round in, in all 22 rookie drafts. I mean, you can't ask for more. Yeah, 89.8 PFF grade in week one, 86.9 in week two. He's got three sacks already through two games. And just for context, that's on 40 snaps. So over the course of a season, that's like 30 sacks, which is obviously not realistic, but it's pretty cool. Like he's doing really, really well in the limited role that he's been given. Uh, and I definitely think he's worth rostering at this point. Uh, fourth round pick for uh, the Steelers. And again, you can find edge rushers in the draft, which is why I didn't like the Bradley Chubb trade, but yeah, something to follow there. And then a few other guys I just wanted to point out, uh, DeMarco Hellams from, uh, he, he's a safety in the league. He had a great uh, preseason week two. Uh, a couple other guys, uh, Bill's tackle, Richard Gorjage had a great week. Uh, center yeah. loop. What not was sure his name? Say it. I'm not sure how you yeah. say Guriage. I tried my Gouriage. best, man. I tried yeah. my best. The linemen don't get the blur. air time, so we, we never learn how to really <laughs> pronounce them correctly, right? That's what we're that's what we're here for, though. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. There's some guys on the offensive line that I I even like look to see some of their highlights, right? And there's not even a highlight tape on them. These are NFL players that don't have a highlight tape on the internet. So it's tough. It's tough out here to pronounce these names. But uh, Luke Weipler is a guy that was a name in the pre in the uh, pre draft process. Center for the Browns had an excellent week two as well. He's an exciting name to follow. And then the receivers, Josh Downs, Jordan Addison, Tank Dot Dell. These are bigger names that were huge names during the draft process, but these guys are showing out. And there's something in common about those three guys. All three of them were kind of seen as some of the best route runners in the draft, along with Jackson Smith and Jigba, who also is doing well. But these guys are really uh, performing well in PFF grading. So something to track in your all 22 leagues. Then at the running back position, Emmanuel Wilson, if you haven't heard his name, he's the running back for the Packers. That was kind of a fringe rostered player, but I think he's definitely earned his spot at this point. Keaton Mitchell running back for the Ravens out of East Carolina. Uh, he was a guy that we did play, pay attention to in the offseason. He has elite speed for the position. And in the Ravens offense, there actually might be a role for him there. Uh, so this breakout 
in the preseason is something definitely to follow for your all 22 team. My guy, Deuce Vaughn, is another name who had an excellent week two in addition to his week one. So I'm going to keep pushing his name out there as much as I can, uh, spin move after spin move. So Deuce Vaughn, keep an eye on him. And then the quarterbacks, right? So Aiden O'Connell had an, another excellent week throwing two touchdowns. Great PFF grading week two. Looked tremendous again. His accuracy, his arm strength, all is looking elite. Uh Jimmy Garoppolo, I don't even think is practicing yet. So there might be a story to follow there. Uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, again, the guy in the Browns, has been absolutely killing it. Bobby's boy from day one. Uh, keep an eye on him. And then last but not least, Tanner McKee for the Eagles. Again, a guy that like probably doesn't necessarily make the roster if he's not coming out here and having a great preseason performance. But he is playing extremely well. Not going to get starting time. Don't know if he's really worth rostering at this point, but it is something to follow that he will maybe be a competent backup for Jalen Hurts going forward. So exciting names to follow there all over kind of your all 20, all 22 drafts. Uh, but Ray, is there anybody else that you wanted to point out or any of those guys that you just want to talk about? The last name you mentioned is interesting there, Tanner McKee, because he's performing really well, but his game is so different from Jalen Hurts that if Hurts were to go down, right? I mean, Marcus Mariota hasn't performed very well, right? Does So I, I don't think he's like really just solidified himself as a no-brainer backup, but at the same time, you would have to change pretty much everything you do if you wanted to go with Tanner McKee. So it's a bit of a weird situation there where I'm just, I just, I'm interested in seeing how it fits at the end of the day, right? You don't expect, you know, anything to happen as far as him seeing playing time early on, right? Say, you know, heaven forbid something happens. And in week three, the Eagles need to go to a backup quarterback. It's probably going to be Mariota because again, stylistically, you're not just changing your entire offense around for a young quarterback like Tanner McKee right off the bat. But if he keeps playing well, maybe this preseason and then maybe next preseason as well, I think the Eagles in particular, we've seen uh, in the past, have had backup quarterbacks perform well in the preseason and then in spot starts. And then they flip them to a team that needs a quarterback for like a second round pick or something. And that guy's a starter for a couple of years, right? It hasn't always worked out. Like what is it, Kevin Cobb, I think uh, from back in the, in the late Reed days um, was AJ Feely. Another one, I, I think as well, I'm trying to try to think back here. It's actually crazy how many years have gone by since those names have, <laughs> have been around, but so that's another scenario too, where it's like, okay, you're not necessarily rostering this guy. We're looking to draft him in a rookie draft, for example, this summer, but you just kind of have an eye on him. And if he keeps performing really well, you might want to just sort of stash him somewhere in the event that he does get traded or end up getting an opportunity to start somewhere and get some snaps. And then maybe his value really increases from there. So uh, that's one. A lot of the names you mentioned too, like DeMarco Helms is another one who has you know a really high coverage grade in the preseason so far um has played well but has jesse bates and the falcons drafted richie grant at safety a couple of years back so he has two names in front of him uh but grant hasn't necessarily really taken hold of of the range there at safety in the nfl so far so if he doesn't take a step up and demarco helms keeps performing well that could be someone who finds himself in a starting role sooner than later as well. So, uh, you know, that, I think those two I really wanted to highlight because it's just a unique situation for McKee. And then there could be an opportunity there for Helms, uh, depending on how things shake out. We know that that Falcons defense isn't necessarily the greatest. And yeah, I think Richie Grant is basically on the clock with this performance from Helms so far and, and um, really needs to step it up if he wants to solidify a spot there on that defense moving forward. Perfect time to transition into our hidden gems. And I'm going to start with the NFC South Atlanta Falcons. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those safeties, right? So that's kind of what I put here. It's it's either Helms or it's going to be it's going to be that Richie Grant. So I have Richie Grant here just temporarily, but I think it could be either one of those guys. And the reason being is because the Atlanta Falcons went and spent a ton of money on their defensive side of the ball. And uh it's it, it, their, their front seven's looking a lot stronger, right? They go and add a couple veteran pl uh, players to shore up that defensive interior. They're looking much better. And then they go and add Jesse Bates. So the guy that's lining up next to Jesse Bates is going to have a pretty easy situation. And one thing that they're going to be able to do is they're going to be able to try to make big plays, right? And big plays equal kind of high grading, right? If you, if you make a big play, it's going to spike your grading more than just an average play would. And I think this player is going to, whoever this might be, it's going to have a prime opportunity opportunity to do that we already talked about 
uh, Helms having kind of his breakout in the preseason, grading extremely highly on what is actually legitimate snaps. But Richie Grant showed a lot of promise last year as well, right? He um, raised his grade from a 56 to a 69 from his rookie year to his sophomore year. Nice. Something we really like to see, right? That's that's a that's a great increase. And then you go and add all of this talent in front of him. That's that's great for him, right? The opportunity should be a little bit easier in year three if he is the starter at day one. Uh, I like a lot of things that he did with matching up with running backs. He knows how to come downhill fast on run plays, and he also has really nice instincts in the passing game lining up against running backs as well. Uh, if you go and watch his tape against Carolina, you're going to see a lot of that, and you're going to walk away very impressed. I think he has that in him. So if he does hold on to this uh, this spot that he has right now, the starter next to Bates, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But look out for either one of those guys to be the breakout for the Falcons in uh, in 2023. Yeah, so that is that is a nice grade for uh, for Richie Grant in 2022. But um, I think maybe it's just because he was a, he was an old rookie. Maybe that's why I'm too hard on Richie Grant. Uh, he is a bit of a downhill player. But uh, then again, when you're a quarter century old, like when you're in, in your second year in the NFL, you sh- you should be good at uh, triggering downhill. You know, it's one of those skills you should pick up over time. Um, I agree, the opportunity is there. I just want to see more. I haven't seen that playmaking ability yet. He he triggers downhill. He's he's decisive, but he's not explosive and hasn't made those big plays yet. And it's you, it, you just want to see that, especially from a safety position. That could really change the complexion of your entire defense if you have a playmaking safety. Um, but like you, it was tough to pick a sleeper. So um, one name I wrote down was really one who didn't qualify, and that was Arnold Evacati because he was a top 40 pick in the 2022 draft at edge uh, got off to a really fast start and kind of hit a rookie wall last year. Um, but again, he was a rookie kind of to be expected, right? He showed the flashes that we mentioned. We want to see whether it's from a young player in the preseason or just sort of overall in their first action in the league. You just want to see why they were drafted highly. And he, he showed that, right? He has a great long arm move, um, but he does need to increase uh, some of his play strength on a down to down basis. Uh, and the Falcons just as a whole just need guys to finish plays from that edge spot. They, they, that's really something that's been missing from them for several years now. And so I think he could be that guy to step up, but, uh, we got to see it like kind of like safety. The opportunity is there. It's just now time for someone to actually go ahead and take advantage of it. Bit of a homer pick. Yeah. He went to the greatest university in the world. It's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. Just super high character guy. You know, it's, it's just a fantastic guy. You'd love him. You'd love him if you ever got to meet him. He's great. He's great. So for people that don't know, he, uh, Ebi went to Penn state. So did oh, Ray. So yeah. of course he's choosing Ebi Uh, and I agree. He has great opportunity there. I definitely wanted to see more of him last year, but I think now with Kalias Campbell lining up next to him, um, you know, that his job's going to be a little bit easier. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and again, with guys like Jesse Bates, hopefully Jeff Akuda comes back healthy. Like those guys making, uh, you know, the quarterback hold the ball a second longer should result in more sack opportunities, more hurry opportunities for a guy like Ebiketti. So it's a good pick. I like it. Um, let's move to Tampa Bay. Why don't you kick off Tampa Bay? Oh, Tampa Bay. I, I I almost feel like this one is cheating too, because it's Jamel Dean, and. He was a top 10 graded cornerback last year overall, and it's like none of you even care. He had the 17th highest cover grade of all corners. And if you just study him, just his history in the league, he's had four straight years of 70-plus grades at cornerback. Hello, that's a that's a volatile position. It's a valuable position. He's had four straight years of 70-plus grade. And now Carlton Davis is out of there, so he's going to have a bit of a bigger role in Tampa I mean, what are, what are we doing here? What, what are we doing? Why why are we not talking about why are we not talking about Jamel Dean so much more often than we actually are? He's a good player, and now he's got a bigger role. And yeah, the division is still not great. It's not like he's going up against the Chiefs twice a year or anything like that. So we need to be talking about him a whole lot more than we are. And um, yeah, just time to put some respect on his name. So yeah. That, that, that's what I got. I don't have too much to say about him. And I'm sorry, it's not Carlton Davis who uh, who left. It's Carlton Davis who's opposite him as he now slides into the uh, the top two uh, cornerback slot there over there in Tampa. So my mistake. But yes, um, I'm all in on Jamel Dean. Have been for a couple of years now. He's just quietly had some really good play 
uh, at the cornerback position, which is what we're all searching for because that's the difference-making or a difference-making position on a week-to-week basis for you in all 22. So, yeah, that's my guy, Jamel Dean. And the guy I was looking for who had left Tampa is actually Sean Murphy Bunting, so got him and Davis mixed up. So Sean Murphy Bunting went over to the Tennessee Titans. So uh, now Jamel Dean uh, has a much bigger, sort of more defined role at corner there, whereas previously kind of the three of them, Dean, Murphy Bunting, and Davis, kind of you know all had a pretty decent chunk of of uh, responsibility there in the secondary. But now with Murphy Bunting moving on, uh, you kind of have two of those original three left, so they each take on a bigger role. And I think he's ready for it. So I'm a big Jamel Dean fan and looking forward to watching him this year. I'm struggling giving you this one, right? Guy just signed a $50, $52 million contract with Tampa No one's Bay. talking about How the heck is he a hidden gem? Because no one's talking about $52 million. I think that's the first time we mentioned him this entire podcast series. We're like almost 40 episodes in. We've never mentioned Jamel Dean. I feel like no one does. No one ever mentions this guy. And he's a good player. He's a real good player. So guys, if you don't know who our number... 10 cornerback is it's Jamel Dean. So he's a hidden gem just because you're not talking about him, even though, all right, whatever. I'll let it slide only because I had a really hard time with Tampa too. And the reason I had a hard time is because this is really one of those teams that we talked about earlier with Baker, right? They have their studs. They have their aging veterans that they kept around here. And then they kind of let other people walk but it's like this weird rebuild time where they didn't have a ton of draft picks to add players. So it's just, it's kind of a weird transition period for Tampa. So the guy I picked, total cheat as well. I picked this year's second rounder. I haven't picked any draft picks from this year, this entire thing. I did it today just because I love my my boy, Cody. Cody Mock, the, uh, he's going to be oh, playing gosh. guard for Tampa, but he's my boy. And I, I don't think there's enough being said about him. So I'm going to talk about him because I loved what he did at North Dakota State. He's 6'5", 302 pounds, played tackle there, played the position really well. He has great uh, skill in the run game. He played in a very advanced uh, blocking scheme out there in North Dakota. I thought he did a great job using his hands, his body control, all things I really value at tackle. And they decided to move him to guard. But I think he absolutely could play tackle in the NFL if they decided that's where they wanted to play him. The Bucs have Tristan Wirfs, and they're actually using Godeke as their other tackle. I think that could be maybe a temporary thing. And if... uh, if Mock outperforms Godeke, I could see that switch happening. But for now, he's playing guard. He's already slotted as their starter on the right side. And through two preseason games, he has a 74.5 pass blocking grade on 42 snaps against Pittsburgh and the Jets, two of the best defensive interior groups, even when you're talking about second, third string. Uh, these th- Those are really great groups of players. So I like what I've seen out of him already in the preseason. And I think a lot of people are sleeping on him. Uh, I see it in the rookie drafts. I think in our rookie draft, I was able to get him in the sixth round. I think he should be going much, much higher, especially considering how hard it is to draft guards in all 22 and how thin that position group is. This is an easy answer for me if you're doing your rookie drafts to get him in the third or fourth round. And if it's a startup, definitely grab him, uh, have him be your third guard. I think that's a very reasonable place for him to be on your all 22 roster going into 2023. Yeah, he's only two calendar years younger than Jamel Dean, who's now on his second contract. So sure, I guess we're both just cheating for for the sleeper pick for the Buccaneers <laughs> tonight, but uh, <laughs> just throwing that out there as well. So uh, he does Dude. look polished and uh, yeah. What? What? Sometimes you do what you got to do. You know what I mean? Sometimes I, I get you do it. what you got to do. And some teams I mean, don't have a guy. Yeah. I mean, we, we said it you know, before, I think off air, it's like, hey, this it's tough to for the NFC South to pick some of these hidden gems because it's not a very good division. If there were more gems, I think this division would be a lot more highly thought of than it actually is. And the reason it isn't highly thought of is because there's not many hidden gems out there. It's like established players and then a bunch of guys trying to find their way through like this corn maze field uh, to find their role in the NFL. So um, yeah, a little tough, but I, I, I like Malk. I think, it, I think it, it, it could be a good pick. It's a solid pick. It's someone that you could just plug into the offensive line. That was, that's just sorely needed. Right. Um, like you mentioned, they're not, they don't have this bevy of assets for like this, this long rebuild with, you know, just super premium high picks or anything like that. So if you can get a guy that can plug and play at an important position to solidify your offensive line, I think you go for it. So, um, yeah, I like the pick. Yeah. And it's also hard because like, right, like 
two of the four teams have picked top 10 like every year for the past five years. So like they're not sleepers, right? Their first and second round picks are are top 40 picks, all of them, right? And it's like, it's hard to get sleepers out of that. And uh, Atlanta, right? Like they go and draft Kyle Pitts and 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 uh, B. John Robinson. So they're not really drafting valuable positions. So again, it's like, it's hard to find those players and teams that just aren't really building themselves the right way. But we'll see. We'll see what they become. Let's move on to the Carolina Panthers. And I actually have a wild one. So I'm going to kick this one off. And you're going to love this, right? This is totally your guy. I'm going okay, with 34-year-old go Justin oh Houston. 34-year-old Justin Houston. And I'm going with the hidden gems as this is a guy that's not going to be on your roster for years, but you could get him very cheaply and he can be an absolute stud on your team. So that's why I'm going with Justin Houston. We all remember the days of him you know, creating havoc in Kansas City. Uh, but he actually spent the last two years in Baltimore. And if you haven't been paying attention, he graded out with a 73.6 and a 77.8. So that is still a very, very productive edge rusher in all 22 and a guy that you would definitely roster on your team. I expect that they brought him in to be a leader of that defense, right? It's a very young defense. And he slotted across from Brian Burns and next to Derek Brown. That makes a very intriguing front, you know, front four, front seven that the that the Panthers now have to work with. They have some good linebackers there as well. So I think it's going to be a very intriguing group. When I look at that team and I say, who's the guy I could get cheap? It's obviously going to be Justin Houston. You could get him basically for nothing. I'm sure you could pick him up in free agency, but look at how productive he is. He can absolutely be a starter for you in a pinch. Have him be your third, fourth guy in this year alone. Don't count on him for long term. But again, he's a guy that came away with 11 sacks last year, 11 sacks on less than 300 pass rushing reps. That's good for second among all 16 pass rushers with at least 10 sacks that for, for the fewest amount of uh, snaps played at uh, pass rush. And I think this pass rush, rub, pass rush group in Carolina is very talented. So again, they're going to be creating a lot of pressure for quarterbacks in this weak division. And I expect it expect that to translate to really good things for a guy like Justin Houston. So that's my pick, 34-year-old. That's that's not a gem. That's an antique. All right. There's a huge difference. Damn. That's, I mean, uh, that was we, good, right? That was good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we we talked about Jerry Hughes a couple episodes ago, right? And so you just couldn't let him have the, you know, the old man glory. He had to just just share the love with Justin Houston, I guess. Um, I guess that's as good a pick of any as far as the Panthers go. Uh, I literally wrote down in my notes, no freaking clue. There's not a lot of gems on this team, period, let alone hidden gems. Even some of the high-value players that they're really counting on have to kind of step it up, right? Like Brian Burns, he's got a lot of splash plays, but consistency down-to-down down has been a bit of an issue in the last two years for him after a really strong 2020 season. So um, even guys like that on this team have to really step it up. Uh, Chase Horn. have. Yeah, J.C. Horn, is, well, again, he wouldn't be a hidden gem for sure, but he's just got to stay healthy. Great player. Got to step it up. Um, exactly. No, yeah. he's a guy that they invested a lot in, and he just really hasn't been on the field. He hasn't been healthy. Availability. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if he doesn't have that availability, he's got no ability for you, right? So, um, but assuming good health, right, you, you count on that, or you rely on him as someone who's going to get the job done and and do what he needs to do. So, yeah, I mean, outside of that, none of these gems are really hidden, right? I think Shaq Thompson at linebacker is a pretty decent uh, option overall, kind of a solid player, but not necessarily a gem, I would I would say. Uh, Frankie Louvu can be a bit hit and miss week to week, but he certainly has some upside there. So, sure, I guess if you're going to go with uh, Justin Houston, go with Justin Houston. I, I, I can't begrudge you for it. So we'll see if he has a big enough role week to week. Uh, at his age to uh, to make a difference. Yeah, and you mentioned it. They're linebackers, right? I think that that's a really good area to find value on this team. Shaq Thompson and Frankie Louvi, Louvu, they're they're both really good players for the hidden gem category. In 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 that you don't have to invest a lot to get them, and they're going to be startable level players for you probably most weeks. And uh, yeah, like I think they're both good players, but from my mind. I think the better value is in Houston just because I think you could essentially get them for free. But let's let's finish this thing strong, Ray. We're doing a great job just kind of uh, making up the NFC West right now, or sorry, the NFC South. And let's finish with the New Orleans Saints. Who do you got for them? Uh, yes. For the Saints, I have Rashid Shahid. So he was the 17th overall graded receiver last season. Uh, 
didn't play, I think, until like week six or seven. And this is just a guy who's just fast, just an absolute speedster who could take the top off of the defense, averaged 17 and a half yards per catch last year. Now he has an upgrade at quarterback and still isn't the main focus of opposing defenses, right? All the talk is about the progression of Chris Olave uh, heading into year two and Michael Thomas, uh, you know, coming back from, you know, a three year vacation because he sprained an ankle in like 2017. So he's back. And so that's really been the talk of, of the Saints offense when in reality, Rashid Shaheed has carved out a bigger role for himself. Again, has an upgrade at quarterback and can just take the top off of a defense and just break a game open in one play. So again, he's a high grader, someone who's going to get a high snap share and can take over a game on any given week. So he's someone you can grab real late. Receiver is so deep and no one is mentioning Rashid Shahid as someone you should be grabbing to kind of round out your receiver rotation, but that's just because he's not a big name. But just because he's not a big name doesn't mean doesn't mean he can't have a big impact for you. So my sleeper is Rashid Shahid. I low-key love that pick, and it's because I I often roster Derek Carr, and I know what kind of receivers he likes. And he he's a different kind of quarterback where he likes to spread the ball out. Like he's not really a glue on to one guy, and that's the guy he's going to go to every every uh, play. So I like the speed that he offers because it reminds me of kind of like Henry Ruggs from a few years ago. Like, no, they're not the same kind of players, but that speed, Derek Carr likes that kind of speed. Uh, Nelson Aguilar as well, right? There was like guys like that that were always coming through, doing really well in uh, Derek Carr's offenses. So I think that's a really good pick. My pick, not as exciting. And I've actually talked a lot of smack about the group of guys I'm about to mention. Um, But if you kind of saw this transition, right? When Drew Brees left, you saw the offensive line take a huge step back, right? Some of the guys on that offensive line were playing at a pretty high level. Drew Brees retires. They've all been there that long. They really have, even though they're a pretty young group, they've all been there that long. But when he retires, you see this like huge regression on that offensive line. And I always talk about how I like investing in offensive linemen that have good quarterbacks. So for example, when Tristan Wirfs got drafted by the Buccaneers, I automatically, even though he wasn't my highest graded offensive lineman of that draft class, Andrew Thomas was, I love that he was going to play with Tom Brady, right? Him going to play with Tom Brady made him so attractive to me. So when Drew Brees retires and you have Jameis Winston, it was kind of like the opposite thing happening. And I feel like a lot of those offensive linemen took a step back. So guys like Andrus Pete, Eric McCoy, and Cesar Ruiz haven't really lived up to their draft draft spots, right? two first round picks and a second round pick on interior offensive linemen. And they've graded horribly over the last few years, horribly. I'm talking like fifties and low sixties grades. But if I was to invest in any one of them and think that any one of them could have a comeback to me, it's Eric McCoy. He's only 26 years old. He's still a young guy. He has pretty good uh, kind of, you know, maturity. Now he's played, he's played a lot at his young age, four years. And he has his two years with Drew Brees. He was a 70 plus grader. Brees leaves, he's a low 60 grader. There was literally a 10-point swing in his play when Drew Brees left. So now you bring in Derek Carr, who's more um, mature quarterback, right? Better system quarterback. And I expect him to kind of go back to that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that 70 grading that he had early on and center. Again, it's, it's one of those positions that's very hard to draft. So if you could get a guy that's consistently a 70 grader, that's a pretty good starter at this, at the center position in all 22. One other thing that I always talk about is I love players. I love hidden gems that are going into contract years. No McCoy actually just got paid, but the saints have an out on him in 2024. So they could essentially walk away from the contract. They just gave him with very little impact to them. So Every year, McCoy is essentially playing for his contract, right? And I, I really like that. So another reason where, why he'll be motivated to play, play at a high level, is because of that contract, better quarterback. I just think that, you know, if I was to invest in anyone on this offensive line to improve their stock, it's probably him. That might be the best one yet, because I, I actually, when I was trying to make my pick here and looking, right, obviously I love my Rashid Shahid pick. I wanted to make a case for Eric McCoy. I think I drafted him in our inaugural draft in 2020 after he had a great year. He was actually a top five center in 2019. He graded very well. And I was like, I can't just come on here and just tell people I like him because I freaking like him. Like I always liked him. That doesn't mean anything. Right. But you made a good case there about how the, 
the the loss of a veteran quarterback there really impacted not just him but everyone around him too and now that they have a veteran presence there you don't have to think that Derek Carr is a top six or eight quarterback for him to have an impact on those around him the fact that he's a veteran who has seen pretty much every which different coverage and blitz that a defense can throw at him over the last what eight or so years in the NFL now um, you know he can call out those protections and get guys in the right position and be that positive sort of force for the players around him, even if he's not an elite player. Um, and so, yeah, I think I hope to see that I really do because I, I have a pretty decent amount of shares in, in guys like Cesar Ruiz and Eric McCoy. Uh, and I agree with you, McCoy in particular is the one that I would really like to see sort of go back to that form that we saw early in his career in his first two years especially because the, the center position really needs it. That's, that's a, that's not a deep position at all. It's like three or four guys. And then just who cares after that? Uh, he could be someone who can ascend into that top, that upper echelon of, of the group. And I would love to see it happen. And he's still a player with a ton of years left. Uh, if he gets back to form uh, in that regard, he's only, he's going to be 26 years old this season playing, uh, playing in 2023. So lots of time left for someone like him, if he can get back on that track. Definitely, man. And and like what you said, right, you could say anything you want about Derek Carr and, you know, not thinking he's the best quarterback, but he's a very mature quarterback. He's a system quarterback and he knows how to play the position well. Uh, I would love to see Sean Payton if he had gotten hired to replace uh, McDaniels in that offense, right? Because I think what he said about uh, the Jets' new offensive coordinator, what he would say about McDaniels would probably be much worse because I think what he did last year in that Raiders system, how he destroyed that team after what the Raiders did the year before, it's, it's pretty uh, shocking. So I expect the Raiders to be firing their coach at some point this year and for somebody new to be stepping in there at some point. So uh, Derek Carr should be a huge upgrade over Jameis Winston. But uh, Ray, we did it. Yeah, we, we came out on top. I think that Saints one was, uh, you know, put us back in good standings with our people. I, I think so. Yeah, we were struggling there for a minute. We were struggling there for a minute. So although tough. Jamel Dean, you have to talk about him so much more often <laughs> than you here. all are. Everybody <laughs> should go tweet something nice about Jamel Dean after hearing this episode. He deserves it. Absolutely. We'll start a chain. We'll start a, a thread. We'll start a thread for Jamel Dean. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at all22 underscore PFF. And leave us a review wherever you watch or listen to your podcast. And again, we are live for signups with code second season, the number two ND season for $20 off your all 22 membership. Get in there and sign up all 22.com. We'd love to have you. And thanks again for listening. Let's go.